Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Lunar, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Trish Murray. Dr. Trish Murray is a highly accomplished physician who has been certified in four different medical specialties, including internal medicine, osteopathic manipulative medicine, energy medicine, and functional medicine. All of this after being a teacher for a decade in public education and completing medical school in the top 10% of her graduating class at the age of 38 years old. Dr. Murray has designed numerous courses in osteopathic manipulative medicine and has taught hundreds of physicians in continuing education programs for more than 10 years. Her hands-on as well as internet-based nationally accredited courses are sought after by physicians worldwide. Trish is the founder of Discover Health Functional Medicine Center. Welcome, Dr. Trish, to the podcast. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, and you have accomplished more in one lifetime than some people could accomplish in four. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm kind of type A, so I just keep moving, doing more things, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so why don't you tell us kind of where you start out, started out, like where did you grow up, um, maybe a little bit about your family, how you got it into, you know, teaching and then doctoring and many types of doctoring. Yes, yes, sure. Um, well, first of all, I grew up in a suburb outside of, uh, of Manhattan, in New, you know, outside of New York City, by New York. Um, I was one of six children um, and an athlete throughout most of my childhood. I was good and I, I had four older brothers. So it's kind of like, you know, you, you better be an, you know, an athlete and be able to defend yourself kind of thing with a bunch of boys running around. But, um, and, uh, but at about probably 18 or 19 years old, I actually, as a relatively elite athlete, suffered an injury. I was a women's lacrosse player and I went to cut to get a ball on a rainy day. I was wearing my cleats, but my foot didn't catch. And, and I actually, at that very moment, herniated a disc at the base of my spine. So, boom, you know, like that, my life was very different. Um, going to doctor to doctor, looking for answers, honestly. And the traditional medical model, you know, surgeons, and I mean, we did the MRIs, we saw the disc, but, you know, went to um, surgeons and different doctors, and, and they really didn't have the answers for me. And it was one doctor that said, um, you know, you need to strengthen the muscles around the injury. And again, as I said, I'm kind of type A. So um, <laughs> I took that to heart and I became a competitive bodybuilder. Um, and that's what brought me back to health through exercise mm -hmm. and diet and nutrition and things like that. Um, and so that became the other way I could stay in athletics and things like that. Um, but my dad was a lawyer. And my dad was a lawyer in Manhattan, and I always aspired to be kind of like my dad. I was like dad's little girl, and I loved being with him, so I really thought. But then I, in college, I went to uh, NYU, my undergrad, and um, I worked for dad. And I was like, oh, I cannot sit around and read paragraphs and edit contracts. That's not me. I need to interact with people. So I decided to train in teaching. Um, which I've always loved information and concepts and then how to be able to explain them to other people. So um, that led me more down the path of the education degrees. Um, and then I was a high school teacher in a public school in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, and I coached, I coached basketball, I coached field hockey, and I coached lacrosse. Um, and it was really fun. But you know, you do something for a while and, and it's just, oh, you know, the rest of my life is this, because it just didn't seem like, you know, I was doing a lot of unique things where we were doing group teaching with multiple teachers and things, um, where I let the social studies teacher, which is what I was, and the English teacher and the science teacher and the math teacher had the same group of students. And we would have walls that would open and all this stuff and we had projects going on. It was really neat. But you near reach a point where it's like, okay, another 25 years of the same. And it just, for me, and having had that injury, it was like, well, what do I want to do with my life? And I said, well, I want to learn more about health. And so I ended up, actually, when you're a teacher, you have to go to for a master's degree. It's like a requirement, if you will, within 10 years of getting your degree. And so 
I was in a master's degree program for education. And so I was being handed a, my master's degree on a Saturday when the Tuesday before that, I went into inorganic chemistry as an undergrad because I had decided that I wanted to go into the health field. <laughs> and that wasn't my background. So um, that was kind of unique. And then I basically got all the prerequisites to go to medical school. And actually, I had originally thought of going to chiropractic school because I had hurt my back. And actually, the one that put me back on the field was a chiropractor through manipulation. But it was my own chiropractor that said to me, Trish, don't go to osteopathic, don't go to chiropractic school, go to osteopathic medical school because then you will be a full physician and you will be opening way more doors for yourself to be able to do many different things. And so that led me down, you know, that path, and I've never looked back. I absolutely love the training. Um, my original training was in internal medicine. I did my residency in internal medicine. But then I got into primary care and, and traditional medicine and realized, wait a minute, I'm pushing pills, and I have 10 minutes to, to interview this person and figure everything out and then determine interactions between medicines and figure out what's the next medicine I'm going to try. And that's absolutely not why I went to medical school. And so I stayed in the traditional medical model as a primary care doctor for about three years. And then I went on to specialize in the osteopathic manipulative medicine. What that means is that I interact with someone around pain and I look at their structure and I work with my hands to treat their pain and to bring balance back into their body. Did that Solely, I opened my own practice. I did that for about eight years or so. But then again, I said, well, I'm not answering, you know, you don't answer everything for people with just manipulation. You need more. And I never threw around, threw away, of course, all my background in internal medicine. And so I heard of the Institute of Functional Medicine. And functional medicine was started by a biochemist who obviously was looking at all the biochemistry and saying, well, wait a minute, what about these vitamins that are cofactors for these chemical reactions in the body? And what if they would make something better rather than the synthetic pill? Um, also, what about what we eat? What about what we think? What about our, our emotions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So I didn't look back. I went right in and became a functional medicine specialist. Wow. <laughs> so you, you, something it's just, it was like a journey where you see something and then you see something else that can help and you go to that. <clears throat> just dive right in. Yes. Um, if, if I'm in, it's, it's like anything in life. If, if you have a passion and it's a passion or something intrigues you, you, go after it. It's why not? You know, I'm 57 years old. I'm going to be 57, whether I, stay in my habitual daily life and, and don't look beyond, why not? <laughs> why not jump in, learn as much as I can and, and keep learning? Because that's why we're here, <laughs> you know, to learn the lessons we're meant to learn this lifetime and learn what we're meant to learn. Wow. So then you went into the functional medicine, which is the, the, the biochemical piece. So how are you putting all that together? <laughs> Well, that's a great question because functional medicine is really about root cause medicine. Um, you know, it's looking under a lot of stones and meaning when someone comes to see us at, in a functional medicine environment, we do an entire timeline of someone's life. Like, first of all, not even, even before you're born, like what was your mother's experience in carrying you? And then what was your birth like? And then what was the first 10 years, the second 10 years, the third 10 years, meaning physical issues, medical issues, emotional traumas, you name it. We want to know about it because I'm looking for the antecedents, meaning yeah, genetic and pre, you know, things that are coming at you from other people. But we also want to know the triggers. Like if someone took antibiotics for the first six months of their life, you know, constantly, then you'll notice that that's going to set them up for, let's say, the irritable bowel syndrome or other gastrointestinal problems, or maybe even the anxiety they're suffering from in their 30s or 40s or 50s. So we need to know all of that, again, looking for 
the root causes of problems. And obviously that's very different than what I described with a primary care doctor that says, okay, I've got 10 minutes, what's your issue today? And here's a pill for maybe what's causing the problem. So functional medicine isn't just about biochemistry, it's about all of the background, all of the history, and looking at someone's daily environment, and then also, of course, looking at their physical exam and looking at their blood work and putting it all together that wonderful world, word holistically mm -hmm. to try and say, well, all right, these systems seem to be like your gastrointestinal system, let's say, and your hormone system seem to be the two systems for you that are the biggest issue. So now how do we approach that and how do we help you get on a journey of healing? Yes, and um, this might be a loaded question, but I just want you to answer based on your experience. So. I, I've heard some people say that so many of our illnesses are kind of psychosomatic. In other words, we think things or we, there's something emotionally happens and then all of a sudden something physical happens. And then, but then there's the biochemical part. Okay, well maybe just the chemicals are off and now we're feeling this way because the chemicals are off. Do you know what I'm asking you? What has been your experience? So. Yeah. So I mean, for example, Someone, again, I brought up anxiety or depression or, psych, you know, different emotional states that are problematic in, in, in the traditional medical model. You know, you're given an anti-anxiety medicine or you're given an antidepressant. Well, for example, one of the most common antidepressant medicines is a uh, serotonin receptor blocker. So we, we're trying to increase the amount of serotonin in someone's body. Well, guess what? Serotonin is produced the most by your gastrointestinal system. So what I'm saying is that our psychosomatic stuff that, that you know, if the traditional medical model can't figure it out, they give you the antidepressant, they can't figure out the bio. Folks, so many problems start in our gut. And there's a concept out there most people are familiar with today called leaky gut. Um, and what that means is that your gastrointestinal system is a hose that start, you put something in your mouth, you eat it, you chew it, you swallow it, and it's inside the hose now, down your esophagus, stomach, and then your intestines. But the hose is, has a wall, and that wall should be, have tight junctions so that things that aren't supposed to be absorbed into your body don't get absorbed. But if those junctions are not tight, you'll notice they're leaky, and things will leak through. Guess what sits right behind the wall? Your soldiers of your immune system. And I talk about this in my book and I explain it all, but right behind the wall that's protecting your innards from stuff from the outside world is your soldiers, your immune system. And if you have leaky gut, then you're constantly leaking things to your immune system that shouldn't be there. And then what's the job of your immune system? It's to protect you, it's your soldiers, your army, your navy, your air force, your marines. So they go to battle against, and that causes inflammation. And if inflammation is up and it's throughout your body, guess what's going to become inflamed? Your brain. And therefore, you're going to develop possibly anxiety or depression or other things. So that's one possibility. The other possibility with your question I would bring up is the concept of patterns. We are emotional beings first. And rational being second. I mean, the way our brain is set up, we know that we react emotionally to things first. We've all had that argument with a spouse or a, or a friend or a brother or a sister and walked away and went, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just did that. It was because you were acting emotionally. And then you walked away and you quieted down and all of a sudden you were rational again and said, oh, I can't believe I just said that. You know, that kind of thing. So what I'm saying is that if we are patterned around anxiety or patterned around frustration or patterned around emotions of anger all the time, then we become patterned to think that way. And so we, gotta, we need to figure out some way to transition ourselves and shift our patterns to a more positive um, compassion, empathy, uh, joy, happiness. And there are ways to help someone shift their patterns, whether they be emotional patterns or thought patterns or physical patterns, but many of that is things to do. So you could, 
I guess my point here is that it could be biochemical, it could be chemistry, it could be inflammation, but it also could be thought patterns and patterns from our childhood that we've been programmed into or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was really helpful because I didn't realize that even the autoimmune type things were coming from the gut. Absolutely. Autoimmune is one of the top, meaning there are three things you must have in order to develop any autoimmune disease at all. And this is in research journals. One is the genetic risk. Yes, we all are born from our parents and we're, we inherit our genetic aspects. But the problem is that we've thought for too long that that's the number one and that's all there is. We're destined to develop our ge parents' genetics. The second thing you need to have is a barrier dysfunction. You notice I mentioned your gut and the, wall, the leaky gut piece. The barrier dysfunction would be the gaps in the wall of the, of the lining of your gut and leaky gut. The third is a trigger, an emotional trigger or a food trigger or something that's triggering the immune system to become active. Stress can be a trigger. Um, any of these toxins can be a trigger. Um, and they irritate the immune system. So when the immune system is overactive, it can have, it can make, like I said, your, your immune system is your military. So it's defending you. What happens if a soldier is awake 24 seven and it can't rest? It's gonna make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens with autoimmunity is your own immune system, auto means self, and immunity means your own immune system is attacking you. So the immune system is attacking self. So if that's the case, we, you know, you've got to have the risk, genetic risk, a barrier dysfunction, and a trigger to initiate that overabundance of inflammation or, or immune system overactivity that then has friendly fire and starts attacking your thyroid gland or starts attacking your joints or starts attacking your gut, or whatever it may be that you are at genetic risk for. Mm -hmm. wow. that, that is just amazing how you put in, you're putting all those things together. And as you were talking about putting something in your mouth that going down into your gut, I was thinking about the different journeys I've gone personally with diet, because at a certain age I was doing something and it was working, and then I switched and something else was working. And I mean, I've I've been vegetarian, I've been paleo, I've been keto, which I don't think I do the keto very well, but, um, <laughs> and then I've heard that the bad guy is almost always wheat. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on wheat? What should we be putting in our mouths? <laughs> well, that's an excellent question. And the number one thing is that it's very individual and that there is no one answer for anybody. And so it's a journey, it's not a destination. And that's the thing. I've been doing this for so many years now. And if I think back 10 years ago, if I think back three years ago as to what I was eating, it's, 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 it, it changes over time. Like presently I am following a ketogenic diet, even though I did a genetic study on myself and the best diet for me from that genetic studying was a Mediterranean diet, which you notice would include, include some grains. So I said, Oh, I can eat grains. Well, the tire around my abdomen as a result of eating more grains, thinking that that was okay for me, was getting bigger and not smaller. So what I said was, all right, I'm going to try the ketogenic diet and go no grains. The one thing I would say to anyone though, and that I promote, is that the base of any diet, whether it be paleo, ketogenic, FODMAP, you name it, must be plants and must be the color of the rainbow red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. You need to eat every color of the rainbow every day. Five to seven servings minimum a day. After that or within that, you then could decide, okay, well, how many grains do I get? But the other thing I would say is another pearl is that no matter who you are, you should only eat one or two servings of grain a day, period, whether you tolerate gluten or not. And we'll talk about that in a second. But Grains all get converted to what? Glucose, sugar. We have an obesity and a diabetes epidemic in our country. Why? Because if you go back to the old food pyramid, it told us to eat like eight to 10 servings of grains a day. And that's all sugar. 
So the problem is we need to avoid grains. Now, some people, 1% or 1 to 3% of the population out there are celiac. I mean, let's talk about gluten. That's a very small percentage of the population. And that is a pathology that's a definitive diagnosis. Usually you can do blood work, you can do biopsies of the, the, you know, the, the intestinal lining and so forth to diagnose celiac. Someone who has celiac disease cannot eat gluten at all. It will cause very definitive illness. However, the other thing is called non-gluten so, non celiac sensitivity. And so people who have sensitivity to celiac, to gluten, sorry, are about 20% of the population. So you'll notice that we have not an allergy, if you will, to gluten. If someone has an allergy to something, like you know, a little child, and they can't even be in the room with peanuts kind of thing, you have an immediate reaction. A food sensitivity doesn't show up right away. It may show up anywhere, it could show up right away, but it doesn't have to show up for up to 72 hours. So if you had some gluten two days ago, and now you don't feel well, you notice you're not going to put that together and you're not going to notice it. If you're eating it every day, then you just feel lousy all the time. So the way to do this, first of all, again, 20% of the population could have non-celiac non gluten sensitivity. Um, so that's a big percentage. So how do you figure it out? Well, I talk in my programs about what I call the Detox Plus program. For three weeks, you eliminate either one item at a time or multiple items at a time, and you avoid them. You eliminate them from your world for 21 days. Why 21 days? Because it allows your immune system to quiet itself, and it's not overactive anymore. Then you retest the one item, or if you have eliminated multiple items, you eliminate, you start to rechallenge them very systematically one at a time. So let's say you're test, you've been off gluten for three weeks, and now you're going to test it. You would eat it today and see what reaction you have, if any. Let's say that day goes by and you're like, good, I'm fine. Well, the next day, eat it again. Because remember, it's up to 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So the third day, you eat it again. And let's say the third day, all of a sudden you have a headache and you have abdominal pain or you have diarrhea or you have constipation and you weren't before. Hello there's your sign that gluten is a problem for you. And this concept of the elimination diet can be done for, again, one food at a time. But the problem with that is what if you're sensitive to more than one type of food? You'll notice you'll, you'll still won't feel well. And then you'll say, well, I still don't feel well, so it, I don't think it's food. Well, maybe it's multiple things. For example, I am sensitive to dairy, gluten, and caffeine. And I haven't eaten. You know, I don't ingest, I mean, never say never. I mean, there's a certain state fair near me in New Hampshire um, once a year. So I do, and there's this best pizza place that you ever taste pizza in your life. I probably have one piece of pizza a year and it's at that fair. But do I know I'm going to feel really lousy afterwards, almost like I have a bad hangover? You betcha. So it's up to you, to, you know, an each individual. And this is the point where it becomes very individual. How do you determine what your sensitivities are? You, you need to do the work, which is actually to do a comprehensive elimination diet. And I have a program I call the Detox Plus program, which is available on my website. And someone can get videos as well as a, guided, uh, a guidebook you download, and it tells you exactly how to do it. Well, that's really helpful because it is – you know, and that answers my question of why it, one thing was working at one time in my life and now something else is working and, and the other thing isn't working. So that makes total sense. And, and then as um, people get older, a lot of times things change too with hormones and with, I don't really know what changes. So what changes? Why is it that it seems like the, we can work out harder and we can... Um, eat less, but we're still gaining width. <laughs> yes, yes. The scale is not our friend when, when that happens. Um, well, there's so many things that could be playing into it, but let's talk about some. 
for, for let's use myself as an example. One thing is stress. I run my own business. I, I run a podcast myself. I do a monthly webinar. Um, I try to get to the gym. I, you know, I have to take care of, of course, myself. Um, stress is a big part of my life and trying to make sure I manage it well. Increased cortisol will cause excess fat to be stored, particularly around the waist. So stress is something that people need to look at. And as we age, we do not handle stress as well. So we need to find balance in our lives. And we have to look at that. Another thing, again, is thoughts and emotional things. If we are someone who is constantly coming from a, at the world from a place of anger, frustration, everything's a challenge, then you notice that feeds the stress. And stress causes leaky gut. So there's a connection there. Another one would be, um, you know, physical stuff, meaning some people are actually exercising not enough, which majority of us are not, but some people are actually overtraining. And so that can lead into cortisol problems, lead into leaky gut. So our hormones definitely change as we age. Our body cannot handle as much as we age. So sometimes we, we look at ourselves and we keep pushing ourselves when sometimes we need to back off a little. Sometimes we just need to find more balance between work and play and family and social things. So it's, and this is where that's why that timeline in the functional medicine world and really working with someone and getting to know them helps because again, it's not a one size fits all thing. It's what's the elephant, I use that term a lot, what's the elephant in the room for this individual I'm working with right now? And, and, and that's what we need to work on. And it, it can be different for every single person. But there are so many reasons why I get it though, that people feel like they're eating like a bird and exercising like a banshee and still not able to lose weight. And that's where it does come down to, you know, again, back to some concepts around diet and nutrition that I've had a lot of people say to me, well, I know what I need to do. But to be honest, I've been studying this for the last 10 to 15 years, and I'm learning every day new things, and we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Because when people come and take our classes, they're like, wow, I didn't know that, and I didn't know that, and I didn't know that, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So there's always more to learn. And what does sleep have to do with it? So I've heard people say, well, you can go with less sleep, or you need more sleep. Does that change throughout the life? Does it change... Is it by age? Is it by, you know, some people are very, you know, like you're running your own business. So I, I know you probably have long work days. Yes, I do. But I also have my own personal rules in the essence of I go, I stop it and close it down and go home because I need to, and I need to turn the brain off um, and rest. So that's important. Now, sleep is huge. Um, you know, one of the best neuroscientists out there today dealing with Alzheimer's and cognitive decline and dementia is Dr. Dale Bredesen. And he started a program called the Recode Protocol. And I am certified in that program. And I work with folks concerned about cognitive decline. And I personally have a genetic risk for cognitive decline. My mom died of, of Alzheimer's disease. So I walk the walk and talk the talk every day. And sleep is extremely important. Because during sleep, I mean, we, I've done a webinar about sleep and, and the idea of REM sleep and other aspects of the phases of sleep. But the big point I would make is that when we sleep, our brain is detoxifying. And the computer is downloading stuff that isn't figuring out what's needed and what's not. So if you don't get appropriate rest, and what science these days is saying, essentially, and research is saying, what's the optimal amount of sleep would be anywhere between um, eight and nine hours a night. So you really want to look at that and ask yourself. Now, the other thing, though, is back to you mentioned, as we age, our hormones change. As we age, we do not produce as much melatonin. Melatonin is our sleep hormone. It should be up when we're going to bed and lowest when we're waking up in the day. Cortisol, our stress hormone, should be highest in the morning and lowest at night. So you notice those are opposite of each other. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the things if someone has excess stress and isn't sleeping well or bing at two o'clock in the morning, they're waking up and they can't get back to sleep, is you should try start out with three milligrams of melatonin at bedtime. And if three milligrams isn't enough you, and you're getting older, you could increase it to six. You could go up to around nine and see what happens. You're gonna, at first, you're gonna feel a little groggy in the morning, that's what happens, but over time, you get more used to it, you don't feel as groggy in the morning. But melatonin is not a sleeping pill. It's a hormone that you need to take consistently for a while, because it's not only gonna help your sleep because you're taking it, but it's also gonna regulate your cortisol better and keep it so it doesn't come up at night and wake you up at two or three in the morning. So you notice these are things that, first of all, sleep is extremely important. There's also things about sleep hygiene. You don't want to be on your cell phone or your computer. Uh, you know, get off of it about at least a half an hour before you're going to unwind and go to bed. Um, obviously, no TVs in the, in the bedroom. Um, that's not a good idea. And then this idea of if someone's having insomnia, um, this idea of melatonin as we as we're aging and our sleep cycles uh, being broken up, you could try some melatonin. Wow. And then um, I know many people have a concern about getting older and starting to lose their memory or Alzheimer's or, you know, those declines in that way that basically takes the person, the living person from us. I mean, they're there, but they're not there. So is there certain habits, diet things, supplements, something that if someone's very concerned about that, if they have a history in their family, they can Absolutely. do it? Absolutely. What, what Dr. Bredesen talks about, this is his analogy. If you take a barn and it has one hole in the ceiling or the roof and you you know, mend that one hole, you're not going to have any more rain in your barn. If you have 30 holes in your roof and you only mend or fix two of them, you're still going to have a lot of water in your barn and you are not going to be dry. They have found in their research up to as many as 30 different, and that may, it may have gone up now, <laughs> different sort of environmental daily lifestyle as well as vitamin deficiencies and hormone imbalances that someone could possibly have. And if you have, for example, thyroid issues and uh, sugar issues and emotional issues and you don't exercise and you're eating too much sweets and you have inflammation, every single one of those I just listed off is another hole in the barn. The other thing is this all starts decades before anyone starts to develop any memory problems. And again, this is a passion of mine because my, again, I was one of six children. My mom did not get married till she was 30 years old. So I was in my twenties when my mom was in her late fifties, early sixties and starting to lose her memory. And I watched my mother decline and decline till she, she didn't pass until she was 86 years old, literally a vegetable in a bed. So I will not, I'm not going down that path. <laughs> and so I understand the science and I realize that I need to look at my diet. I need to look at my exercise. I need to get my sleep. I need to look at my uh, vitamins and nutrition and make sure I'm optimizing it. I've decided I'm not drinking alcohol pretty much anymore. I mean, I just went to my niece's wedding in Sonoma, you know, it was a destination wedding and I had one glass of wine, okay? But essentially I don't drink anymore. Why? Because I know I don't detoxify it well anymore and I don't want to go down that road. So I've made the choice to give it up. And I have a good friend that has a wine cellar to die for. <laughs> so this was a, you know, this was an important decision for me. And it's just a decision I've made for me. Everyone has to look their own selves in the mirror and say, okay, what, a, how is my life right now? From, from, from a dietary perspective, from an exercise perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a physical perspective. And if there's answers that say, hmm, that part of my life, I'm not feel like I'm doing as well as I could, then you need to look at it. 
And if people are out there like myself, entrepreneurs or running their own businesses and things like that, you know, we need to realize that you're not going to be able to keep doing what you love to do if you don't look yourself in the mirror sometimes and say, well, I love what I'm doing, but if I'm not taking care of me, then I'm not going to be able to keep doing it. So it's something to be, think about. Yes. And you, you are trained in so many areas. So I have a question about uh, another area. So one of your medical degrees is in manipulation of the bones, of the structures. And um, we were talking about just before we got on that I was telling you, well, I have, you know, trouble with my hips. It's chronic from a car accident, you know, but it still seems like no matter what I do, it just wants to go out of alignment. So how do we keep ourselves in alignment? Well, you know, again, osteopathic manipulation, chiropractic manipulation, other forms of physical work, massage and body work. There's a lot of different avenues out there that someone could seek out help. But what I have recently, for a number of years now, I've taken all the information I've learned and I've applied it on myself. So I've developed and done for myself for a number of years how to align my own spine. And so recently, basically just this year, I said to myself, why am I not teaching this to people? <laughs> you know? And so I put together a course and a program and I started teaching it locally in New Hampshire where I live. And it's been amazing. People love it. So now I'm looking at it and saying, well, how do I package this in the appropriate way to get it out there to the masses? Because it's amazing. Now, what is it about? Well, first of all, our body has a holistic system in it called our connective tissue system. It's called fascia. If you've ever um, peeled an orange, you know, the white stuff underneath the orange, and then you'll see the lines of it that make it into like the, the pie looking pieces. That white stuff is fascia, it's connective tissue. If you've ever uh, cooked a chicken, of course, and tried to peel the skin off, that shiny stuff between that won't let the skin come off, that's fascia. That's a holistic system in our bodies and in fruit and in animals that surrounds everything in your body. The other part of the connective tissue, of course, is muscles. And muscles turn into tendons that then attach to bone. So folks, we are like a puppet. Our bones are the bones of the puppet, and the, the connective tissue are the strings that actually cause us to be able to move. So if you, and we develop patterns in our fascia, in our connective tissue, that give us imbalance or misalign our neck or, or our hips or our pelvis, and there are ways that I teach people to move in order to use the strings to pull on the bones to bring them back into balance. And it's not difficult, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but the concept is you're mobilizing, using your joints like your hip or your neck, and you're moving it in a certain way to try and get the connective tissue to pull the bone and unwind the patterns in the connective tissue that have become out of balance and then also mobilize the bones to bring them back into balance. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's something that we all, the other thing I also emphasize to people and every patient I see that has pain is majority of us are too tight. Probably 80% of the population is too tight and maybe 10% of the population is too loose and then maybe five or 10% of the population is doing really well. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, the one thing I teach my clients all the time is to stretch every day and really basic. You don't have to be tying yourself up like a pretzel. Actually on my website, discoverhealthfmc.com, my company is called Discover Health Functional Medicine Center. So if you go to the website, it's discoverhealthfmc, so you don't spell it all out, .com. And if you go to the health library, it's one of the horizontal main menu items, if you go to the health library, everything in my health library is free. And if you drop down to exercise videos, you will see that I do a video on level one stretching. It is the most basic concept. And anyone could just watch it and do it and then make that sequence a part of your life and do it every day. 
I, people come back to me and say, you know, I'm doing it every day. It's the best thing I've ever been taught. Why hasn't a doctor or someone taught me this before? And I, I just say, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. So that would be something to take a look at. Yes. And I was taking a look actually at your Facebook and website and um, you are doing so many things at your center besides just seeing clients. You're having classes, you, you have a podcast. Um, in fact, I saw on your Facebook that you had actually been nominated as Heart of the Community Award in yes. your area for helping to bring the community together. And, you know, one of the things I was watching is that you were talking about having a yoga class and having stretching classes in an hour and a half class on Saturdays for people, which, you know, I've learned from uh, one of my uh, doctors that she said, you know, we're all kind of getting arthritis the older we get. So you have to always stretch. <laughs> you have to stretch every day and, and you're providing that for the people. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's the thing that doctors do is say, you need to do this. Well, what about providing avenues to teach people how? Because most people say, well, I'm not sure what to do. So I, I have the videos, but also, yes, one thing that's out there is the concept of group medical visits. They are perfectly, you know, acceptable. I actually learned about it on the American Medical Association, you know, the, the American uh, College of Family Physicians website. Um, They're paid for by insurance if someone's insurance works well for them to be able to utilize it. So yes, we're, we've gone hog wild into the group visit concept. So yes, on Friday mornings, we run a yoga class from 9 to 10, 15. And if someone's insurance fits, they see me for about a 5 to 10 minute check-in before the class. And then they get two classes for that visit and it's covered by their insurance. We do five week, this is different now, within my DENT curriculum. Again, my book is Make a Dent in Chronic Disease. And that DENT is an acronym. The D stands for detox. E stands for exercise. N stands for nutrition, and T stands for transformation of stress. So what we've done is we've taken my whole curriculum and we've created a five-week group visit program on the detox, where everybody together goes through that comprehensive elimination diet for three weeks and then two weeks of rechallenging the foods. We do it with people, and if it fits, then they can use their insurance. If it doesn't fit, because let's say they have a copay and a high deductible, it costs them more to take the, you know, do the insurance than to pay our flat fee of $150 to take the class. Um, so some people it fits for insurance and other people it doesn't. But the bottom line is it's a five-week program. And what we've learned is, and we know from research on group visits, is that we are social beings and people need to be in community and we learn so, I don't have all the answers, <laughs> neither does my health coach. So we learn from you, you learn from us, and it's all a community thing. We, I was just talking in a staff meeting before I came on with you, that in um, coming up this winter, we want to do a game night where we, people come together and just sort of play games together and have fun. It'll get us moving, it'll get us out, and it'll, have, and it'll get community. So yeah, I have been uh, nominated for that, I'm really honored and excited about it. I don't know if I've been awarded it yet. I'm going to Florida next week to this conference where that's where I was nominated for it. So I'll have to let you know. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it Thank seems you. it's well deserved for all you're doing. And as you were speaking, I'm just getting goosebumps thinking, my goodness, that what you're doing in your one center, if that could turn into a movement, across the US, mm. how much change would happen in people's health and their lives and their happiness and their, you know, quality of life. I just. Oh, I, I totally agree. The people that are in our tribe is growing and growing. And I see that we, one thing we do also on my website, if someone goes to the website and they get that horizontal menu, you go over the one that says start here. Um, and you drop down, the first thing someone would see would be a medical symptoms questionnaire. And what that is, is, it, is you look at the different systems of your body and you score yourself on all sorts of different things. And in the end, you come up with a score. 
an overall score. To score optimal health is to score on that survey less than 30. I have people that come to see me that score 150. So, but I've also seen people go from 150 to 24 regularly. Mm -hmm. So we have people in our tribe that just love it. Um, they come to our different events. They're part of our group programs that we do. Um, and they, they absolutely love it. Now, the other thing is I'm, I am expanding, you know, beyond our local area. I do have Zoom, like we're doing a Zoom now with this uh, program. My health coach works with people through Zoom. I also can do, you know, group one-on-one uh, -on -one visits with someone. I do follow-ups sometimes with people in a uh, HIPAA-compliant programming. So it doesn't need to necessarily be that you're right in New Hampshire. It's something that we can work with. We also have had the idea that as we do our programs, we can do group programs on Zoom, Zoom has, or other avenues of like this, where people can have a group and be in a community. I'm part of a business mastermind and it's a group, it's a community of people. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it, it, I get it that if I could, you know, start to create a system and a model that then could be expanded and shown to other folks, it would be awesome. And I, it is happening mm -hmm. in other places. I am not, I'm unique, but I'm not the only person doing this. There's a lot of functional medicine providers out there doing similar concepts and specialty group visits is a big movement in the functional medicine world. Um, but absolutely, I mean, I've just got an awesome crew that, that's working with me right now, and we are just, we're, we're rocking it, actually, in my community, and people are loving it, so it's great. Yes, well, I'm loving it, too. I just, uh, it just excites me to no end, just thinking about it, and... Right. Yeah. And, and w earlier when you're naming all the different areas to kind of look at, you know, your stress, your diet, your exercise, your everything. Um, I'm a person that I really like to have accountability or I like to have a something to keep track of things. Is there something you use to help people keep track of where they're at in different areas? I know you said that one um, survey they did at the beginning to see where they were at with the number, but is there mm -hmm. something that they use daily to kind of grade where they are that day or that week? Well, yes, the medical, first of all, that medical symptoms questionnaire we always use as an objective measure. The other thing is um, journaling. Journaling is something we highly recommend, and my health coach really works with people on that because that is such a wonderful way, and it doesn't have to be really long. You don't have to be sitting there for an hour journaling about every thought or every idea. It's just, you know, make a list of the things you feel you did well this today and make a list of maybe the things that didn't go so well today. I, like when I go home and I talk to my family, we like to ask each other, what was your peach and what was your pit today? <laughs> um, and we share that with each other. So that's something someone could get in the idea of journaling and that would be possibly their record. For themselves oh well that last week i was you know it was a pit for me every day that i wasn't doing this let's say and now this week i'm doing much better mm -hmm. so that's probably the number one way that what i've found is that you know and i and i've looked and i have people present to me you know on this cell phone app you know or this idea where you could um measure or um keep track or something like that. And you know, every time I look at those, I, I'm just like, you know, one more technical thing that we're gonna have to keep track I of. It's like, come on. You know, we have so many things to keep our track on. So I would probably say, you know, the number one thing I would say to anybody is put your feet on the floor for every day and list what you're grateful for or what you're doing well. And then, you know, later in the day or that evening, do that as well. What's your peach and what are you doing well with? And then maybe list a couple things that you, one or two things that you feel didn't go well that day and think about why and then how could you possibly change? Mm -hmm. Because our challenges in our life is what really makes us move and, and, and change. You know what I mean? We don't, if we want to focus on the things we're grateful for. We want to focus on the things that we're happy about. We want to focus on the things we're doing well. Don't get me wrong. But the things that are going to cause us to shift are the things that are challenging to us. 
Um, and I appreciate the universe's challenges, and I try and look at them as if they're exactly that, a challenge. You know, some days you're the, you're the windshield, and some days you're the bug. And, and, so, and some days, the, when I, the day that I'm the bug, it actually causes me to look at my life more and say, okay, well, I've been a bug now for the last five days. Why? And what do I need to do to become the windshield again? And, and that makes me move. And, and so sometimes our challenges are good for us. And other times, you know, we want to obviously boost ourselves up. So you should be focusing on the positive. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, let's say you just found that you're the bug, like you've been the bug for years. <laughs> And, and, and you're real discouraged. You know, let's say someone's really discouraged. Maybe they have had chronic pain for many years or they have diabetes. They just can't seem to control. Where do they start? How, how do they get themselves motivated and moving? Because sometimes you do get in that emotional area where that physical thing has held you down so long. And you, in you, in your mind, you really do want to live. You do want to change, but it just seems so hard to even, like, let's say someone with arthritis and their knee is hard, so hard for them to even just get out of the chair. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, and again, this is a concept of a journey. It's not a destination, um, and it's one baby step at a time. So, some thoughts would be again. To in, if someone wants to shift and they want to take a step, one of the first steps would be, if you're a reader, start reading some books in, in the functional medicine realm, let's say, or in the realm of what you're seeking. Um, in the realm of functional medicine, again, my book, Make a Dent in Chronic Disease, it's like that thick. It's not, <laughs> you know, it's not this thick. And, and I'm writing for the lay person. I'm not writing for a doctor or a medical person at all, because um, again, I was not a school teacher. Besides that, I would say, again, try and focus on the positive in your life. Put your feet on the ground every day, or put a little stone in your pocket, you know, a pretty stone or something, and every time you touch it, say something that you're grateful for in your life, so that you're enhancing the positive and trying to put a positive bent around what you're trying to do. When it comes to, let's you, you brought up an example of someone who, let's say, can't walk very well anymore because of their knees, so they can't get out and hike. Well, exercise, folks, is not just for those who can, it's for those that think they can't. So you can do a lot of exercises sitting in a chair, and it's just a matter of maybe Googling and looking. That's where you might start. Or reaching out to someone like us at Defense Discover Health Functional Medicine Center, and we help you. It, it's... What's your challenge and how could you possibly start thinking? Also, my podcast, Discover Health, um, is available. Again, if one link is to go scroll to my website, go to the health library, and the podcast will be there. Look at some of the titles and just start engrossing yourself in listening and learning and being one little step in. And then maybe you listen to something and you say, well, I can try that. So you try it. I want you even in this podcast today, eliminate gluten for three weeks. That's it. Just do that. Or just eliminate sugar for three weeks and see what effect it might have. Or go to my website and look at the level one stretching and just do that for 21 days. Stretch. That's it. And see how it affects you. Oh, well, that's helping. Oh. What else could I learn? What else could I read? What else could I listen to? Your podcast, you're obviously interviewing wonderful people that are talking about pivots in their lives and challenges and how they've overcome them. Engross yourself in a more positive environment. Believe me, I've had my challenges. I am gluten-free, dairy-free, and caffeine-free because I was sick. I healed myself from a horrible injury. I've been down and I've been up and I've been in between. Believe me. This is, and I, I work hard every day to stay, you know, and I just make sure I try and focus on the positive and realize that in my world, the universe is supporting me. Again, any challenge I, I face, it's to, it's to help me 
and to push me in some direction that maybe I need to be focused on to, to live a better, healthier, more fulfilling life. So it's just a little different bent of looking at it. So I guess the first step is just to love yourself. Be great. Think of what you're grateful for. We're all grateful for something mm. in our lives. And then start there and take one step at a time. Thank you. That is so helpful because that is true. That you can take one little thing, just one thing and do it for 21 days. And it doesn't seem so difficult. But if you think, oh, I have five things I have to change, then you get overwhelmed. But if you just take that, if you just pick one, anybody could do that for 21 days. Exactly. You know, anybody could do that for something, one thing for 21 One days. And if you do it for those 21 days, you're going to create a new habit. And, and it's like, oh, well, I actually feel better. Okay. What's one other thing I could do? And you'll notice that three months later, six months later, a year later, if you stay with that pattern, you're a completely different person than you were three months ago, six months ago, a year ago. I've seen it in myself. I see it in my patients. It, it's just take some step. We're also going to be doing a, um, I actually was approached by a retreat center in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Um, <laughs> and we're going to be doing a retreat there in the end of February. And that's the workshop we're going to do is exactly about what we're talking about, which is take, you know, talk about D-E-N-T, but have people sort of focus and say, what comes to the froth for them? And then say, well, just pick one thing and say, all right, what's your plan? And then live your plan. And then how are you going to measure it? And then go from there. And then from there, you just follow the same system to do it again for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Yes. So I'd like to change gears just a little bit. And I know that so much of your fulfillment comes through your work because you are just dynamic and educated on it and just it seems like it's just in you integrated in you is there other things in your life that um give you joy or happiness or other um things you like to do that aren't necessarily work but there are other hobbies or absolutely i live in the white mountains of new hampshire in a small town called Conway, New Hampshire. And it is an outdoor person's, you know, paradise. So literally I can walk out my back door and walk into the national forest that has, uh, I think it's 800,000 acres, something mm. crazy like that. So I love nature and I love being outdoors in nature. So I want to be connected to the earth. So I go out for walks regularly. Um, and I kayak and I ski and I, um, we went on a canoe trip this, uh, summer, my family and I, a wilderness canoe trip, um, where myself and my partner and, um, my, our, my son and his girlfriend and his best friend for five days, we, there, you, we don't bring your cell phone cause it doesn't work <laughs> where, where we were. Um, so, and we, we just relaxed and played and, uh, it was spectacular. That's my paradise. Um, and then every, I try and make sure I walk every day. I do yoga every day. Um, and I, again, my family and I have dinner together and we talk about what's our peach and our pit. So it's, I absolutely love the outdoors. And I also absolutely love interacting with people and particularly my own family. So that's really, really important to me. So um, any parting words of advice on how to just live the most joyous, fulfilled, satisfactory life? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing for me is something we haven't talked a lot about in this particular podcast is I also have background and training in the energy medicine piece in, as, a, as a shamanic healer. And one of the concepts in that is you are, every, every, any shaman is a, and all of us are wounded healers in the essence of we've all had our own experiences and our own wounds and we can only be as good as we've healed our wounds and worked through them. So there's a concept also of taking the one seat where you sit 
in a meditative state, if you will, and you drop down into your own being and you ask yourself questions. Um, and, and you face the goods and the bads and the challenges and the, and the frustrations and you work through them. And the reason I bring that up here is that follow, you know, you get your answers from your heart and your soul in that and find your passions because as you can see, and as you brought up, I'm really passionate about this stuff. And I, if I wasn't passionate about it, I wouldn't be doing it. I can tell you that because I find what I am passionate about and that's the path I've been on. So that's the biggest thing I can say to people is try and identify for yourself what you're, what you love and how do you know what that is? If you're doing it and you lose track of time, you lose track of everything you lose track of time and you lose track of space and you all of a sudden say, wow, I was just doing that for the last two hours. Let's say that's a passion for you. So keep doing it because that's, what's going to bring you joy. It's going to bring you fulfillment. It's going to bring you joy and it's going to make you want to stay here and be as healthy as you can for as long as you can. So you can keep doing it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Trish. Oh, Dr. Trish Murray. And just thank you for everything you're contributing. And it's just so inspiring. And, you know, to, to, to live well, you have to eat well and be well and take care of yourself. And you're doing so much to, to help people do that. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Yes. And um, hopefully we'll see you again on another podcast. Because I know you have even more to share with us on another day. Oh, wonderful. I'd be happy to. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome.